Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Love Hour podcast. I am your host, Miss Kev on stage, and I'm joined by my husband and co-host. The Kev on stage. And if you are new to the podcast, thank you so much for joining us. We talk about life, love, and the pursuit of happiness based on our own personal experience, plus books, plus podcasts, plus experts. Yes. Today, we have a very special guest. Her name is Dr. Camden Morganti, and she is here to talk about um, the purity movements, because listen, in real life, right, over this podcast, over the course of this podcast, we have talked about the impact of the purity movement on my life and how that has um, uh, impacted my sexuality, my sex life, and like the whole actually premise of this podcast literally started mm. because I started to share my own experience with the purity movement and starting to become and like walk into this idea of what it means to be a sexual being and be a Christian. Like I felt like I needed to like reconcile those two things like Christianity and sexuality um, when they were never meant to not to be apart because if God designed something, yeah. how is it not him? I, I'm not quite sure, but somehow those two things have been separated. And so we're just going to get, you know, basically talk about it. So uh, Dr. Camden, can you um, introduce yourself, who you are, some of the things that you do before we get right, di uh, dive deep into this conversation? Okay. Thanks for having me, Melissa and Kevin. It's nice to see you guys. Thank yes. you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I have a doctorate in psychology and I'm in private practice in Tennessee. I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. And so I'm a therapist. I see couples and women and work on relationship issues and sexual issues and faith, um, Christianity too. And then I also write and speak about purity culture and relationships and faith um, on, on my social medias, on my blog, and then on podcasts. First of all, absolutely love. I love therapists in general that have um, kind of the firsthand experience with the purity movement and then are also able to like kind of com come on the other side of that and have the um, clinical, the tactics, the interventions and those kind of things as well. I think it just offers a completely different perspective that you often don't see in the Christian world where a lot of us in real life think that once you get saved, God saves you from all things and therefore your work is done. Like therapy is not needed. Like additional work is not needed. Jesus paid it all. Yeah, literally. We just say stuff like Jesus paid it all as if we still don't have, um, there's not still a portion that is required of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So therapy can be um, just one of the helpful resources for addressing that, that you can't always pray the problems away, um, that you also need professionals who can come alongside you and help give you those tactics and, and techniques like you talked about. Yeah. So you wrote um, an article that you called the myths of the purity movement, and you have a couple points where you're talking about some of those myths. So I'm going to hand the floor over to you and we can kind of go back. Well, actually, before we go there, can you give us some of your background in terms of your experience with the purity movement? Yes. Um, yeah. So when you reached out to me on Instagram, Melissa, and we talked on the phone, I think something that stood out to me was just how we had similar, we had different life experiences, but similar like effects from purity culture. So that was really interesting. And, and that's why I was excited to come on and talk with you guys. Um, yeah. So my background is I grew up as a Christian. I grew up going to church and reading a lot of Christian books and, and materials and had a true love weights ring. That was a big thing in my, in my church background. And then I went um, off to Christian college where everybody also had true love weights rings and had I made a commitment to abstinence and um, marriage is, was just heavily emphasized in like my church culture and um, my family culture, like that all Christians need to get married and that marriage is kind of the pinnacle of your life. And I dated someone in college and thought we were going to get married and felt like I did all the right things. Um, and then we broke up and I was single for seven years after that. So almost all of my twenties, I was single. I went on to grad school, got my doctorate, um, finished, got my license, got, um, got a job as a psychologist, and then met my husband. We got married when we were, I was almost 30. 
Um, so yeah, so I just felt let down by purity culture because I felt like I followed all the rules like you talked about and didn't get the promises um, that I was that I was told I would get. And so that led me to um, looking at this topic more in like my writing and professional life because I'm still a Christian and I still, really believe in what the Bible says about sex and marriage and, and faith. Um, but yet I just saw that purity culture and the purity movement had a lot of harmful consequences um, that maybe were unintended, but that still harmed us when it comes to our sexuality and our faith. One of the immediate kind of broken promises that you said it just now was that true love waits. Mm -hmm. And I know of, of one of our friends whose parents, or I think her dad or his dad, actually, nope, his mom, his mom waited until marriage to have sex and then they divorced. Mm -hmm. And I can only, um, I can imagine because I was again, a virgin on my wedding day. And I can imagine the heartbreak that I would feel because again, if you feel like you've done it right, then why would this not work? Why would this not be an everlasting love? And I think that's one of the, um, it's one of the illusions of this whole idea is that doing it right automatically means you're going to have like this beautiful love story. And that's not always what happens. Mm -hmm. It's not realistic. Yeah. And so people um, who are listening or watching this may have heard of the prosperity gospel, which is, you know, the belief that if if you serve God, you're going to have health and wealth and your life's going to be perfect, basically. And what purity culture did is it's called the sexual prosperity gospel because it promised, you know, sexual blessings and, you know, wealth, basically, um, for people who um, followed the rules and lived a pure life. And so, yeah, so some those were some of the myths that I identified. And that was some of the ways that I was affected by it. Yeah, that actually is such a good uh analogy because it was like it was such a popular thing prosperity gospel and then it kind of fell out of favor and the same thing happened for the uh purity move, movement but neither are completely gone yeah and the impact on both is still very evident so can we go over your like one of the myths that you identify in the purity culture uh movement yeah. So one of the myths is the fairy tale myth. And this was the one that affected me the most because this is the myth or the promise that if you follow the rules, you'll get your fairy tale marriage, that God's going to give you a spouse and a beautiful mm -hmm. wedding and marriage and family. And for some people they get married, but then their, their marriage is not necessarily a happy one. Like you said, with the, the friend that, you know, and they got divorced or for some people like me, um, being single for a long time is part of this, my story, even though I felt like I was upholding um, the values that I've been taught in the Bible. And so it's just, it's not an automatic thing that God blesses us with, with a marriage um, or a happy one, just because we follow his rules. You can't say that out loud, Dr. Camden. <laughs> That's what I that. preach. <laughs> it was so like, man, me, Melissa and I were just talking about this uh, a couple of days ago and it, it was listen, a lot of things about the purity movement had deeper impacts for women than for men. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it wasn't, I don't know, just felt like it wasn't pushed it on wasn't. men nearly as much. And I don't think the ramifications were as harsh for little church boys of the world. You know, it was like, I don't know, I just didn't feel the same pressures as Melissa uh, felt. But one thing I did feel is if you did things the right way, it would be easy. Me and Melissa never made sweet, sweet love before marriage. And I felt like it was like the golden ticket. Mm -hmm. you, you, if you're, and honestly, a minister elder told us, you remember this? Told us, well, I got to tell you what it is. So first, <laughs> I actually remember. If I had a dream from the Lord that if you two have sex before marriage, your marriage will end in divorce. Yes. You remember that? Yes. I was like, what? That was the first thing you ever told us about our, yeah. our potential future. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was some very like spooky Jesus, you know, like that's an automatic thing. And then there was, unfortunately, there's people who was having sex before marriage and living on that, go out and have highly fruitful, healthy sexual marriages and all of the great things. Mm -hmm. So in, in one way, you expect everything to be nice and easy for you. And also the people who didn't do it right deserve to be punished. And somehow they're not doing, and they're like, and also we better at sex because we got to learn each other beforehand and y'all over there fumbling around in the dark. And now I'm like, 
What? That ain't what <laughs> yeah. we signed up. We got a coupon code for two free hash browns at McDonald's. We turned it in and we didn't get two free hash browns because we came over <laughs> on the street and we didn't see the sign. Yeah, yeah. So it was dangled towards you like a golden ticket, like you said, or this reward. And then when you don't get that reward, it's like, well, what's the point? You know, when you see other people who didn't wait for marriage and they're happy and, and they have a good sex life or a good marriage. And it's like, well, why didn't I just do that? And so that's why I write about the myths, but also about you know, that we can still hold on to these values that we just have to have a reason why that's not based on false promises. Oh, that's so good. I think we can end there as well, because I think uh, where I am currently is trying to make sure that, listen, all of the, some of the things from the bro from the broken, from the purity movement were harmful, period. You're not going to be able to tell me otherwise, because I understand the impact that it's had on my life. But that's not the way, that's not to say that God's principles are harmful. It's just the way that we interpreted them as people and then enacted them as a society that caused. So going back and saying, okay, what did God say? What does he mean? And how do we implement that? That doesn't cause these unintended harmful effects. I feel like that's the work today. Absolutely. And I'm not quite sure I have those answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that I help my clients do in therapy, clients who come to me for these issues is we write down um, a list of like the myths and the beliefs that they were taught. And then I have them look in scripture and read other books and talk to pastors and mentors and people they trust, just basically doing their research to see what of that of those purity culture messages were man made and what are biblical and really true um, to their faith. I, I wrote this on Instagram. Folks didn't like me for it, but child, I did it anyway. I went on Instagram. Was on, I am a foot to it for I take it away. Uh, that uh, I've gone through, or I'm trying to go through this process of, of disentangling church mm -hmm. from God. Mm -hmm. And folks like, you can't, basically you have one without the other. And I'm like, but what I mean is mm -hmm. that there are church isms that aren't God isms. Yes. And that's where the harm is, where that disconnect between the two is what causes harm because God, he, his intent is to harm me. So that means we doing it wrong, not God. But again, trying to like figure out what that message is, you know, to say that I've got it all together. I haven't because I still there's still struggles and remnants of of um, what I call brainwashing of the purity movement today. And I've been married for 17 years. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So a lot of the effects of this can hang on even when you're older and you feel like you've done a lot of work dis de disentangling from it. Uh, and even when you've been married a long time. Yeah. Uh, our friend Candace Binbo said it like this and kind of along, along the lines of what you're saying. Even if you no longer believe that, that tape still plays in your head. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it was taught to you and it was reinforced and reinforced Wednesday after Wednesday, Sunday after Sunday. And even if you know, okay, this actually isn't the way things are anymore, that tape is just like, mm -hmm. that's, but this is wrong, but this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Even your marriage, like if you tell somebody sex is bad, 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 year, seven years old, eight, you get married at 20 and you're married, your brain's just not like, oh, sex is good now. Yeah. That's sex is bad, 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 sex is wrong, sex is dirty, sex is wrong. You know, it's, it's tough to just, switch those gears in my mind i always say you need the amount of time that it was instilled in you to uninstill it so let's you you got at least another 20 or well, the, well, five ten 10 years of work well, the, well actually that's even you started right now exactly that's what i was it. gonna say and i think part of it as well is that those beliefs become it's more than just like i was told this it becomes something that is so internalized that it becomes part of your identity it's, it's it's how politics to a certain extent yes. become part of people's identity so it's like if you don't agree with this i feel like you are attacking me yeah because that's what i believe i feel like that's how that is and so then it becomes well i mean i don't mean to make this like overly dramatic but in some instances if i am questioning a belief that i grew up believing i feel like suddenly i'm questioning me it's like who program. i am yeah. as a person That's... is called into question mm -hmm. that, does that make sense yeah or you feel like you're questioning your entire faith you know if you pull at one thread the whole thing's gonna unravel and 
yeah, and in my writing, I really try to help distinguish between that because I think it's healthy to look at our faith and to question our beliefs and what you were talking about, Melissa. And I've I've heard it said the difference between Christianity and churchianity, you know, like the just being able to distinguish those. And it's healthy to do that. It's a healthy part of our development to question our faith. And if we're not given the opportunity to do that and it's not normalized for us, then we're going to think, well, if if one thread is pulled, the whole thing falls apart, you know, and I just have to do away with all my faith. So good. Uh, we're going to take a break right here and hear from the Love Hour sponsors. Uh, we're taking a break really quickly to tell you about Blue Chew while we're talking about the myths of the purity culture. One thing that is not a myth is a hard peen that actually really exists. And one of the ways to get it is with Blue Chew. Listen, you're married. Your penis Hey, it's had a rough go at it today. Blue Chew, Blue Chew's not going to look at you and say, hey, man, I'm going to laugh at you. It's going to be like, hey, man, I'm going to give you the strength of 10,000 horses. You want to go up and part the wall of Jericho? Get a Blue Chew uh, to give your penis the maximum, <laughs> maximum strength. Listen, spring is here. It's time for you to spring up, sir. Hey, man. It's a new time. It's a new season. And now rise up, rise by the day, I'll rise up. Who do you need help? If you need the help or if you just need the extra oomph to get it there, you can use Blue True. So if you could benefit from some extra confidence when it's time to perform in the bedroom, visit bluechew.com for more details and more important safety information. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free. When you use our promo code LOVE, love. at checkout, just pay $5 for shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code LOVE, love. to receive your first month free. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the our podcast. podcast and our erection. All right. Thank you uh, to the Love Hour sponsors. Thank you so much for sponsoring us. And I hope that you are able to take advantage of their offers. Um, the idea of questioning something and the whole thing falls apart is a visual that I didn't realize that I think I hold on to. You know what it's like? We watched a show called The Mandalorian. I don't know if you watch it, Dr. Camden. Mm -mm. So The Mandalorian is a show on Disney Plus, and it's about this guy who was basically the Mandalorian is a home place for him, and it's also a religion. It's a way of life. And he was taught, this is, you never take your helmet off, you know, things like this. These certain things are honor, power, blah, blah, blah. But he did not realize that other Mandalorians were taught differently. And as the, some are like, oh, I take my helmet off. I don't know. Oh, you on that other, you on that. Basically, he was a strict, strict, devout sect of this, basically, religion. And part of the show as it goes on is like, how do you reconcile what you're taught versus what you are learning? Right. What's needed versus what your parents said was needed. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like, I was taught drinking is bad. Drinking is wrong. Drinking is bad. Drinking is wrong. Drinking is bad. Drinking is wrong. Then one day I went to my grandma's house when I was like 19 and in her door of her refrigerator, there was like, I'll never forget this. It was like six um, Smirnoff ices. And I said, Bex's mom is here. Bex's mom is, is my aunt. I said, what is this? She said, these are smearing off ice. <laughs> I was like, we can't drink? She was like, we can't. I was like, but the whole Christian, I, I can drink. She was like, well, you can't because you're 19. <laughs> I was like, yeah. My whole life you told me we, we can't drink. And then she basically was like, man, we off that. <laughs> what? What do you mean we off that? Me and Melissa didn't drink until we were like 29. Yeah. Wow. 29. Because we thought one sip and you're a wino on a mm -hmm. one way track to hell. <laughs> and now Christian Christians are very different about that. But that took a lot of like, well, what do you mean you can't? You know, we you can, but no. Mm -hmm. You can't. And and but that's just a a you know. That's a, a choice, you yeah. know. Now my audience knows we drink, you know, you're gonna see me in crafts and cocktails, you don't know the Lord, it wasn't it wasn't the Holy Ghost, <laughs> it was other wine. But your sexuality, to Melissa's point, especially as a woman, that is core programming. I'm talking about basic functionings, tenets ingrained with your personality and identity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like how can like how can you learn about sexual health openly when you 
your ba- your first tenets were sex is bad, sex is wrong, sex is bad, sex is wrong, no butt stuff, no this. Some of us were even taught only mission. I remember a person saying only missionary position, You anything else. If you do doggy style, it's bestiality. And I was like, dang. Yeah, so I remember reading that in the Bible. It's just missionary? Yeah. Uh-huh. What if you have a curved peen? Okay. What were you going to say, Dr. Campbell? I was going to say, I don't remember reading that in the Bible, them addressing sex positions and what was acceptable and what wasn't. So that's You know what's crazy, Dr. Camden? This is a good, in, uh, it's, a, it's a good point you bring up. Me, Kevin, I'm not putting this on the church or people. Me, Kevin, sometimes the dog on pastor's word was as good as the Bible. Well, and I It was, was almost say- second- It was. And I think one of the things that's really important and kind of like as people are watching this, um, you know, when we after we post this is to remember we're talking about we were children. Mm -hmm. We're not adults where you can question. I mean, I'm children nowadays. Listen, my kids be like, "Uh -uh, I don't believe that I have questions I got. And I'm like, I'm so proud of you that you have enough to question what I'm saying and kind of come up to your own conclusions. Unfortunately, as a child, I didn't have that in me also because you feel like you don't question authority. And if you're questioning God, then you might be on the verge of a reprobated mind. Therefore, you're on your way to hell. So I didn't have it in me to question. Let me, let me jump on here to interrupt you. In black culture, and honestly, some white people too at this time in our life, we couldn't even question our parents. No. It was mama say, daddy say, grandma say, don't question us. I don't care if we're driving down a one-way street. If that's where we're going and a truck is coming, we just finna be dead. That must be what mama wanted. Correct. Now, our pastor was like our mom and dad exponentially. He was was God's proxy. He was God's proxy. So if I can't question my mom about what's for dinner, I can't even ask what's for dinner. You shut up and you eat it. I definitely can't say, now, pastor, in 2 Corinthians, it says this, and you said that. I believe, theologically, you're in, boy, I've been dead. Yes. Yeah. So you just accept everything as Bible, and this is going to offend some people, or you're going to feel how you feel, because this is something we're working out in our own Christianity. Then we come to find out our pastors ain't even go to seminary. They just repeated stuff somebody mm-hmm. else said, and then people who's in seminary, like, actually, y'all misinterpreted that. What? Mm-hmm. So you yeah. like, you I'm confusing yes yeah I can relate to that and just not being able to question or have any critical thought about something like you know what you're describing Melissa with your kids is they'll question and they'll ask they'll ask why and they want to know you know yeah I don't think that was encouraged um, when we were growing up just that you were just supposed to accept what adults told you and what you know what your religious leaders told you what I read in a book you were just just supposed to accept that as gospel truth and it seemed like very black and white you know yeah. like like you're talking about Kevin with with your um was it your grandma with this with the alcohol in the fridge it yeah it was my aunt Andrea oh, Edwards your, your aunt okay oh, yeah I know why would you say her full <laughs> name <laughs> but she was actually trying to help in that moment she was actually trying to teach you like actually Kevin it ain't what you yeah it ain't what you thought yeah, but we were taught like it's a slippery slope. You know, if you yes. drink, it's a slippery slope to becoming an alcoholic, or if you kiss before marriage, it's a slippery slope to having sex. And girl, you know, put the words. Words in. We are how put many dog on you trips? Is it? Oh, I mean, literally in our teen Bibles, is it okay for Christians to kiss? No, because no. next thing you know, you're kissing and then you're feeling, Every- and then you're sexing, and then you got a baby, and the baby's going to hell because it's born on crap. Everything, what? every. <laughs> experience is a gateway drug (laughs) and it's a slippery slope I'm so happy you said that I think about um and we are gonna let you talk we're talking too much I'm sorry uh that um I think about um my pastor's wife when we were in Washington and this is really random but it's my truth I used to really like the smell of a cigarette when it's first lit I, I don't know why after it's lit for a while it stinks but when it's first first lit there's something about that smell I used to be I used to enjoy so whatever we're going out and I was like oh my god I really like the smell of a cigarette when it's first lit afterward it stinks I don't like it but that first little situation I'm like it just smells I don't know I like it (laughs) I'm she on that rock now (laughs) and I remember my first lady say "Mm -hmm, that's how it starts Mm -hmm. I'm like oh girl I can't just Say I like the way it smells and that's it. Why do I automatically have to now be a crackhead? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, now you want to do drugs. If you want to just do heroin, <laughs> just say that because we can deal with that sin, but you're trying to hide it. We got to call that thing what it is. And this is what happens, Dr. Camden, at least for me. So I now understand, oh, just the thought is enough 
to take me further than I want to go. So let me not question anything. What you tell me is fact, accept it as such and move on. Because if you start to have critical thinking skills and you start to think for yourself, child, you were on your way, well, on your way to hell in a handbasket. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not what it is. And so you end up, at least for me, not thinking for myself. And now I'm 37 years old thinking for myself. And I feel like my whole world is turned upside down. I want to say, and I'm sorry, Dr. Camden. I just, our friend, Brittany Broda said this. When you grow up like we did, all of us, you are so used to being told what's okay and what's not. That even as an adult, you just want me, can I do it or not? Even if I'm going to do it, I want to know, is it wrong or right? Honestly, and I want your opinion on this, Dr. Camden. I feel like what hurt, what helped open my mind was the internet. Because it was somebody else who was studied and it was something that contradicted what I was taught, but they weren't just, they were also a Christian and they were trained. And I was like, but back in the, when we were kids, we didn't have access to that. Right. So there was nobody else to say anything different. And we didn't even go to different churches. Uh, What are your thoughts on that? Do you think, I mean, obviously you were trained, like you actually went to school, but do you think uh, part of your training and then people's access to information that was separate from their then, then their training has also helped people to be like, hold on, wait, what, what is this now? Yeah, I think so. I think diverse perspectives, I mean, there can be harm, but there can also be a lot of good in reading diverse perspectives and encountering other ideas. And I'm a big advocate and I like to read books from all different perspectives, even ones that I might not agree with. I like to read things that that challenge my beliefs to see like, what is the merit in these arguments or what part can I agree with and can I see? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. You know, that's kind of what we're describing here is like, I was taught not to kiss before marriage. I was taught not to date even. I read, I kissed dating goodbye. I don't know if y'all read that book or heard of that, but you know, my parents were like, we don't want to date we want you to court meaning like you're dating for the intention of marriage you know and um you know I didn't follow those rules I did kiss and did and did date Um, yeah and I have no guilt about it whatsoever (laughs) you know so yeah so I'm not an all or nothing person and I try not to provide black and white answers like you were saying Kevin because you were saying like we we weren't taught to think for ourselves so we just want people to give us those answers And so sometimes on my social media, people will send me messages like, is it okay for me to do blank with my boyfriend? You know, how far is too far? You know, is masturbation a sin? All these kinds of things. And I won't provide a yes or no answer. You know, sometimes I'll give them things to think about or questions or some resources to look at. But I'm a big believer that people need to come up with their own um, conclusion and bring in the Bible, bring in, you know, pastors teachings maybe, but bring in other sources too, and really pray about it and see what you think is true for you. I love that. I love that. I, I too, I think I steer away from trying to provide very concrete answers because what may be good for me may not be good for you. Mm -hmm. And that's, Mm -hmm. and I don't want you to feel condemned. And I sure don't want you throwing your condemnation over here. Wasn't Paul, Uh, didn't Paul write about that? mm -hmm, Saying mm -hmm. basically like in my term, look, fam, don't be trying to tell me what to do. You try to hold your best to your morals. Yes. And if this is a person, if this is their morals and this is how they do in their house, respect their things while you're at their house, but don't try to impose your beliefs on other people. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. What is the, uh, we stayed on that one a long time, Dr. Campbell. Okay. What yeah. is the, the next myth? Yeah, we're already kind of circling around it. It was um, the spiritual barometer myth. The idea that you are a better Christian if you are a virgin before marriage, that your spirituality is measured by your sexual purity or virginity before marriage. And so that's getting into what we talked about with identity, that your virginity becomes part of your identity before marriage. And that that gives you value and virtue, especially for women, like, like we were saying, like, especially for women, um, that you're a better Christian and a more desirable marriage partner, if you've remained pure, and that that, that makes you um, just a better Christian woman. Does this tie at all to um, people I've coined this, not I haven't, but I've definitely taken it on with the idea of the good girl syndrome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard it described like that in the idolization of virginity, like making an idol out of it, like, because I thought that, you know, I bought into this myth when I was when I was growing up, too. And I thought that I was a better Christian because I followed the rules and that people who didn't were not as good of a Christian. They weren't as spiritually mature as me. Y'all about um, to better than us heathens out here having sex in the 99 and the 2000. Correct. And look where we are here on the Chef, same playing field. Listen, listen. <laughs> but you know what? That I'm, I'm laughing, but you were sold that. Absolutely. I bought that line hooker sinker. 
Is that how they go? Hook, line, and sinker. I was Hook, line, and sinker. Girl, you know, I'll mess up a saying in a minute. If it's got more than three things in it, it's going to be jumbled. You know, <laughs> low key, what's also interesting, Dr. Kim, that I didn't think about this till you said it. Problematic, I agree. I'm going to just speak for me, Kevin. A lot of my Christianity was, I'm definitely better than unsafe people, but here's how I'm also better than other saved people. Mm. You don't speak in tongues, I do. You haven't mm. preached, I have. Uh, you did this. I, I mean, yes, I've had un, you know unprotected sex. Who among us hasn't sinned? But <laughs> I, I, I've all been heterosexual. I never drank. Yes. I never, you know, what I'm, I was like counting my almost like Boy Scout medals. And even amongst other Christians, I was like always kind of stacking myself up against their Christianity. And and I was doing like I'm better than you type of stuff. And that was I'm talking about outside of I'm talking about in the church walls. I'm looking at the other teams like, huh. I know you smoked that weed. I never did. We even do that amongst religions. Yes. Oh, yeah. uh, someone uh, Cook said religious elitism. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So the next myth is also one that, that you guys have we've talked about already. And I think um, one that Melissa and I talked about on the phone that affected you the most was the flipped switch myth. That when you get married, you flip a switch and sex goes from off limits to now it's wonderful and pleasurable. It's going to be amazing right away. And like you were saying, Kevin, you know, sex was a sin. It was, we were told not to do it. It's bad. It's wrong. Just don't do it. And then all of a sudden now we're supposed to do it. And how do you make that switch? Just because you put a ring on doesn't mean that mentally and emotionally you've made that switch and you can, um, you can enjoy yourself and you can look at it as a good thing instead of a sinful thing. Yeah. Really quickly. We're going to switch to hearing from our podcast sponsors. All right. Listen, I am really, really enjoying this conversation. I also can understand how when you are listening, you might be a little stressed. And sometimes stress brings acne. And adult acne sucks. Is this a real ad we have? Correct. You know I'm suffering from adult acne you right do. now, Melissa. I got a pimple right here. It's going down a little bit. But I had about three last week. And I thought that wasn't wrong. Don't zoom in. Zoom out. Zoom, zoom in, back. Zoom out. Well, Asian I'm 37 with dog on adult acne. Who's here to help me, Liz? Listen, well, Agency, Agency is here to help you. They have a, a team of licensed dermatology providers that they will go through and they can treat your fine lines, dark spots, and other signs of aging. I got a dark old, spot too on my left side of my face. All them years driving down to all death of the digitals well, in they, the sun. Mm-hmm. I got everything these people help with. <laughs> yeah, they help with quite literally everything because as you get older, um, you know, you have different skin care needs yeah. and ensuring that you are taking care of your skin so that it does you right. Now, your skin is your biggest organ on your body, mm -hmm. literally. Yeah. And your face is your face. So you want to make sure you're taking care of it. You got it? Your face is your face. Your face is your face. No matter what your skincare concerns are, whether that's aging, fine lines, dark spots, you have oily skin, dry skin, whatever the case may be, Agency will help you with that. I use them. They have really cute packaging, which I know is not that big of a deal, but I do it enjoy helps. great packaging. So they have really great packaging. You'll meet with your licensed dermatology provider who will create a custom formula with research backed ingredients just for you, which is my favorite part that they are going to customize and create something that is just for you and your skincare needs. Kevin, I will have one of them reach out to you. Reach out to you, to me, Kevin. Yes. I'm going through a rough spot. Right now? Pimples. And yeah. you know, one thing I don't usually have is skin issues. You don't. I got stuff, but I got the belly, I got the hairline issue and all that. But I got the skin. I everybody say, okay, I got the skin. Oh, so makeup artist when I'm on said, Oh, you got such nice skin. I Melissa's do. been there, she's heard it plenty of times. Yeah. Luckily I wasn't on set because they'd be like, You ain't got nothing going for you today. But agency is here to help you no matter what is going on. I tried the anti-aging skincare that uh, uh, formula that evolves and is customized for me. You can go with agency.com slash love hour for a free 30 day trial. Just pay $4.95 for shipping and handling. That's with agency.com slash love hour to unlock your free 30 day trial with agency.com. Go to agency.com for details subject to a consultation. You want to do the consultation because that's how they're going to customize it for you. You hear me? Okay, customize without a consult. Correct. All right. We're going to tell you about Chime. 
who you guys use Chime, right? Bex does use Chime. We have actual Chimers. First hand. I don't know if that's what they call themselves. No, they did. I, I got. I went in a group chat about it. Oh, you. They are. said we are the Chimers. We use Chime. Chime. You guys can use that for free. I'm gonna add you to the group chat. I'm gonna add you to the Chime. Maybe they? They, they do. Mm -hmm. Chat, listen, we already know that if you already have direct deposit, you can potentially get it up to a couple days earlier, but have the direct deposit now. You got to have the direct deposit. Get money they finna just give you. Yes. Get your, uh, not just your paycheck. You can get benefits, <laughs> your stimulus check, your tax. First of all, the STEMI. Big STEMI on Chime? Yes. Yes, yes, you can get them up to two days earlier with direct deposit, plus 38000 uh fee-free ATM with Money Pass and Visa Woo! plus Alliance. Money so Pass? That means you can take your money out. 38, That's 38,000 ATMs, fee-free ATMs. Hey, listen, and you only need one. You go on their little website, you say, this is where I live, and they're going to pull up a map with, yes. with little dots, and it's going to say, this is the one nearest you. And in the app. And in the app. Becca is a charmer for real. Listen, you a charmer, girl. I'll get my money early is what I like to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest selling benefit. With direct deposit. Y'all, we got to be clear about that direct deposit. Y'all yeah. ain't going to come out to, to the chime without the direct deposit. Talk about where my money early. early you got to have it. Because early is on 10. Yeah. Chime spending account is required. Savings account is optional. Enroll in an optional savings account and grow your savings automatically with 0.5% annual percentage yield that's the apy 10 times the national average join the millions on chime sign up takes about two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score apply now at chime.com slash love love that's chime.com slash love love chime is a financial technology company banking services provided by bank corp bank of or Stride Bank in a members FDIC eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. Overdraft only applies to debit card purchases. Limits start at $20 and may be increased up to $100 by Chime. Early direct deposit depends on the payer. Out of network cash withdrawal fees apply. Third party and cash deposit fees may apply. Go to chime.com slash love for details. And we are back. Dr. Camden, when I tell you that this. That's which probably this, this may probably right hit you the here? most is my no uh, this quite literally is the biggest problem that i experience um what i uh, have said before is or my, my personal definition of brainwashing is uh recognizing the truth but seeing but still holding on to the lie and I have found that that's, even though I've read all the books, I've listened to all the podcasts, I've had all the experts on, I still struggle to this day with that switch. Yeah. And I know better. I can articulate better. I literally, I understand better. Yeah. And I still hold on to the lie of the purity culture, which goes back to this idea that sex is bad. And part of my identity was the abstinence and those type of things. Unraveling those things are so layered and so intense that again, even today, that is something that I struggle with. Mm -hmm. How does it still affect you in your marriage today? Oh girl, child, don't, don't have me laying out on the couch. Uh, you you snuck that in, Dr. Kathy. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh dear. She, she turned that therapist voice on. Oh, how see. does that affect you? Right <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah, this was like, cross. I'm hot. People are looking at me. Child, it affects because I often have um uh this narrative about what I am allowed to do and what I am not allowed to do. I have a narrative even about um and I don't really know if this goes back to the, the purity movement, but even indulging in pleasure mm -hmm. can sometimes see, not sometimes, it can feel off limits and something I still, or something I should engage in. And so mm -hmm. anytime those, um, you know, things come up for me, it's a battle. I like often have to make a conscious decision to do or not do whatever my natural inclination would be. But stuff... You can't go there. It's ridiculous. Also, you know what you just said that didn't even click in my mind? We were talking about, uh, or it didn't click into my mind until now. We've talked about accelerators and brakes. And one thing about uh, that's a break is being in your own head. The fact that you can't even, you have to go into battle mode 
with your mind, you already just took yourself out of the sexual 100%. thing. You're like, oh, I want to do this, but can I do this? What, am I, what did God think? Is God watching me? And now you're you are you're not thinking about the pure pleasure of it. Um, the fact that your mind isn't free to roam wherever your sexual thoughts would take you, because now you're in a committed marriage and uh, uh, and the marriage bed is undefiled. But all that stuff is you were 37. Yes, been sure. married 17 years. Yes, sure. Been about to be 17 years, mm -hmm. and you still got to wrestle with that, you know, stuff. And mm -hmm. it's tough, man. Yes, and yeah. you're actively working against it. But it that stuff when it get in, you get in, you're good because you actually it. won. Like. There was a lot of us trying to be virgins at marriage. Well, I didn't even try. I was actually trying not to be. But there's a lot of us who were taught you should be. Right. You actually, I don't know anybody else in our church that made it. I don't either. And that's what be uh, pissing me off. <laughs> you, you won the purity race and they gave the medal to the sure. girl in eighth place. The bamboozlement <laughs> of it all. Yes, bamboozled. Yeah. Yeah. So stress and distraction are huge killers of libido and sex drive. So like what you're describing is like when we're up in our heads and we can't be in the moment, present in the moment, um, then that really gets in the way of experiencing sexual pleasure and experiencing for it for all that God intended it to be. So I think that's what it comes back to is you have to have a clear um, idea of what the purpose of sex is. And Procreation is one of those purposes, I mean, just biologically, but the other purposes that God um, designed it for are for pleasure and for connection and intimacy. Um, and so in your marriage, I think being able to bring it back to that definition, like anything that falls within it's pleasurable, it's, it's for procreation or it's connecting and it's, and it's honoring to God, then, then you shouldn't have that fear and that shame still affecting you. That's what I think is um, one of the most unfortunate things is the whole foundation of the purity movement is shame and fear. Yeah. Yes. And that is that those, those long lasting effects, even in the face of knowledge, I think is what I'm, I still grapple with. Yes. Yeah. So let me talk about shame for a minute then, because that's something that comes up a lot in my therapy sessions too. Um, and sh the difference between shame and guilt, because people will often say like, I feel guilt and shame, and they don't realize that there's a difference between the two, but guilt is when our actions are not aligned with our values. So when we do something that goes against our values and, and who we want to be our character, like if we hurt someone's feelings and we value being a good friend, then we're going to go apologize or make amends in some way. We feel guilt. So guilt can be healthy because it can get us to change our actions to align with our values. But shame is I am bad, not I did something bad, which is guilt, but I am bad or I am wrong or I am dirty or broken or defiled in some way. And there's a huge cultural component to shame, like the cultural messages um, that we're going to be rejected if someone knows what we did or that we're going to be um, judged, you know, so shame is not healthy. It's not adaptive. Um, like I said, guilt sometimes can be, but the shame is really a huge tool of purity culture. Like you said, the shame and the fear was the main tools that they use to convince people to remain abstinent um, by telling you all these, telling us all these myths and, and, and false promises. Yeah. Going back to the idea of the switch as well, mm -hmm. is that, um, again, I mean, they all kind of build upon one another, I have found in my life, but we were just talking about this the other day, that um, I couldn't even bring myself to indulge in a conversation of sex before marriage because I felt like that was the thought that was, was a slippery slope cigarette smoke yes that was my my cigarette slope that was my slippery slope yeah and then you put this ring on and now you're supposed to be able to freely girl mm -hmm. You ain't had no pre-production meeting on sex. We you just well, went straight into production. It was so new. It was <laughs> such a new thing. You hadn't even seen no penis ever. No. And so then you are coupling that with uh, the idea of Christianity and what it means to be a good girl and all of those things start coming to the surface. And, 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 and <laughs> we somehow, uh, this is my own kind of definition as well, that you start to believe 
that the superior person in the relationship is the person who doesn't need the sex Mm -hmm. because sex was so bad before. And yes, Mm -hmm. now we can do it, but real connection is not that. And so you start to minimize and be dismissive of the importance of it in a romantic relationship with your partner, with your spouse, with your husband, with your wife, whatever. Um, You start to miss, or I at least started to miss the importance of it because I feel like the superior connection is that of which happens, you know, outside of the bedroom without that physical connection. Even though sex is literally inside of your body. Well, the other thing, true, but the other thing is that if it's, you know, the way God designed it is specifically for this type of relationship, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really all you need to know. It is something that's secret and something that's a beautiful thing inside of this relationship. And so then to get in this relationship and not understand that it's so backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there should be no shame with that. Um, If, if it's within you know, the purpose, God's purpose for sex. And if it's something that you're using to connect with your spouse, it sounds like what you're saying is you would prioritize like other forms of connection over sexual connection or physical connection. Like it's a good thing if we spend time together and have deep conversations or pray together, laugh together, stuff like that. But having sex is more like for recreation or it's self-indulgent. It's not like sacred. And and it is. Mm -hmm. I I think... That was good. That was that was great. I think what you said is so true. And honestly, the children, the pro, it was like a thing you can do. It helps create people. But indulgence wasn't really a thing we could do in anything. Absolutely. You're really not supposed to be indulging. You know, you should everything in modesty and decency and order. Just sex for sex sake. Why would you be doing that? You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? So, man, it's a wonder we even are where we are now. Yeah, for real. We got a number did on us. But if you read Song of Songs in the Bible, that's all about pleasurable, connecting, indulgent sex. You know, it was, all- a, it was passing over that that garden he was talking about, Cam. He was not talking about no uh, roots and berries. Huh? No, he wasn't. What you talking about? He was talking. I get my peaches down from Georgia. He ain't <laughs> talking about no. Right. Yeah. So. I, so I think filling your mind with those truths instead of what culture has, the shameful message of culture is the key to making that switch, making the flip switch there. I have found that educating myself has been one of the, if not the um, biggest helps in my journey of like overcoming a lot of this. Reading uh, one of the first books that I read um was called The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex by Sheila Ray. I think that's her her last name. Fantastic book. Love that book. And it holds, I haven't read it in many, many years. But at that time, what I found um, to be so different and like quite literally what I needed, it was the first book that I felt empowered as a woman to own my sexuality, where Mm -hmm. I found a lot of other books, they frame sexuality for women uh, through the lens of what your husband needs. Yeah. And so you end up feel, I've said this a gazillion times, you end up feeling like an object in your husband's a sex life instead of an active participant in my own. Mm-hmm. And that was the first book that allowed me to recognize that this is okay for me. And what I can do is for me and not just solely for his benefit. So he doesn't leave me. So, you know, so he doesn't go outside of the marriage. You know, those are the type of messaging mm-hmm. that I had read I cheat beforehand. On you. Yeah. And you feel chastised into it. Mm-hmm. You fear, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fear tactic, really. I got to do this. And it's a, tr- and then it becomes a chore because it's, not for your enjoyment yeah it's painted as one-sided instead of mutual um yeah so I was going to recommend that book and then uh, Sheila Ray Guiguar is her name she just came out with another one called The Great Sex Rescue um and I reviewed that on my website as well as interviewed Sheila on my Instagram live um if you want to watch that that interview with Sheila but yeah she she uh, debunks a lot of the messages in Christian books in her um in her book for The Great Sex Rescue and, and reframes it in a healthier way so Um, But yeah, the lack of sex education and the lack of knowledge that we have when we grow up in the purity movement, that does not lend itself to a successful sexual relationship in marriage. And so I think that was one of the big reasons the flip switch myth doesn't come true is because when you don't have proper education and preparation, you haven't talked about sex with each other because that's a slippery slope to talk about it, you know, and then, then you're expected to know what to do the first night. 
and then you don't. And years could go by and you are dying silently in your marriage. Your spouse is sexually frustrated in your marriage. And I was like, God, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> I literally, I, I, for, uh, the, the premium I, I, I got the listen, you can't, why in God's green earth would I do everything right? And this is the, the benefit. Chad, this sum in the milk ain't clean. This ain't what I signed up for. I read the fine print. I read the terms. I read the conditions and I fulfilled my portion. Oh. And I feel like you, this is a breach of contract. It's not what ah. I expected. I mean, literally. Yeah. Yeah, one of my friends ex- described it as um, a bargain that God didn't hold his into, you know, yes. that she held her end of the bargain and, and he didn't. Um, and I'm, I'm writing a book about purity culture and about these myths. And that's one of the things that I write about is, but was this a bargain that God ever um, agreed to in the first place, you know, or was it something that we made up or we were taught, you know, not something that he promised us? One second, I want to go back to some, you said you talk about Songs of Solomon, Song of mm-hmm. Solomon. Uh, in our Patreon chat, they said them people wasn't married in there. Is that is that true? Oh, I don't know that to be. I've heard some people say that as a way to um, justify premarital sex, but I don't I don't know that to be true. Okay, yeah. I, let me find out they weren't married. Right, we go. I'm going back to El Paso. We're gonna have a conversation because somebody owes me more answers if that, yeah. that was premarital on the premarital sex you y'all I know I deserve answers okay I'm gonna let you go on it Dr. Kim uh before we move on here from the last sponsors for this episode all right y'all we have talked a lot today about uh the myths of the purity movement we've then said you know in order to uh make your thoughts and the new things that you've learned congruent uh Dr. Camden recommends that you do the actions she Mm -hmm. said you've gone out and do it and so you may need blue chew to do that if you're a man and for a woman, you might need good underwear. Mm-hmm. And Third Love is here to help you with those. Oh, yeah. Because they offer not only comfortable bras, but pretty bras as well. I'm a big fan of them. Yes. They have I cup like sizes it. from AA all the way up to I, including half cup sizes, bands 30 to 48, no slip straps, scratch-free bands, memory foam cups. I mean, what do they not <laughs> memory have? Memory foam cups? Memory foam cups, yeah. Oh, I know these boobs. I recognize them. Y'all get information. Yeah, when you put them in there. Super peeking for them nips. They feel like they at home. If you don't love it, uh, exchanges and returns are free for up to 60 days. You guys know. Bless you. Get it out, Liz. Get it out. Get that. These ads are all over the place today. I mean, that's these was like, hey, man, you got to say something else. But you don't, though. <laughs> Uh, they have a fitting room quiz. It's like a personal shopper for your boobs. You're going to go in there. You're going to put in your size, your best shape, your breast shape, current fit issues, and your personal style to deliver bras and underwear that are perfect for you. Because we all know there is nothing worse than being out and about having dreams and goals of what your day is going to look like. And your bra is uncomfortable. You got wires that's stabbing you. You got straps that's coming down. It, it, it pushes up on the side, the back be uncomfortable. All of these things you don't want. I said, no more, Jesus. I've given it up. <laughs> Oprah meme. I said, yes, Oprah <laughs> meme. I said, listen, I need comfortability in my life. I got things to do. I'm a busy woman. I can't be out here fussing and cussing with a bra. I don't know why you would be cussing a bra, but sometimes, you know, you be feeling like it. You be, you know, you be feeling I'll like it. I'll take you there. Uh, I rock their T-shirt bra consistently all the time. You that do. is one of my favorite bras that they offer. They also just recently la- uh, launched a loungewear. They did. Yes. This is big news of the timeline. Yeah, it's so big. Mm-hmm. I've seen a couple influencers actually rocking it. Uh, Third Love, you you know, you could send me that if you want if you want to it looks super super comfortable uh they have every sizes from extra small all the way up to 3x the it's the quality and fit that you expect for uh third love it's a hundred percent cotton french terry woven style oh, i love french terry everything that i've seen online it looks yeah yeah it, it looks phenomenal it's comfortable <laughs> you mean tell me you have a comfortable bra and comfortable woven. loungewear Sounds like a match made in heaven, okay? Third Love knows your one true fit is out there. So right now, they're offering my listeners 20 whole percent Whoa. off your first order. That's double ties. That sounds like tax and some. Mm-hmm. That sounds like the abundance. That sounds like the overflow. Go to thirdlove.com slash love hour love now hour. to find your perfect fitting bra. 
and loungewear and get 20% off your first order. That's thirdlove.com slash love hour. Love hour. 20% off today and you will get that off your first purchase. Thank you so much to Third Love and all of the Love Hour sponsors. Back to the show. Thank you so much to uh, the Love Hour podcast sponsors. We're so grateful for your support. Please make sure that you click the links in our description box if you're interested in supporting our podcast sponsors. All right, Dr. Camden, what's the next one? The next one is the damaged goods myth that if you do have premarital sex, you're damaged goods, that you're broken, that you won't have your whole heart to give your future spouse, that every sexual relationship you had before marriage is just going to doom you to a bad sex life in marriage. Um, and this one is just full of shame. I mean, it just makes people who didn't wait feel um, a ton of shame. And then it makes people who did wait feel a ton of pride, like unhealthy pride, you know, sinful pride. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's just, it's not taking into account forgiveness, you know, and that God extends us forgiveness and that um, he forgives our, you know, sins. If we, if we feel like it was a sin and something that went against our values and beliefs. Um, yeah. And it just sets us up for shame. That's good. And I feel like this one in particular is very women applied. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel as a woman, we are the ones told that we are uh, also, I remember here, well, that we're the ones told that we are damaged and very specifically because we are the receivers Mm -hmm. that we're the ones carrying all of those partners with us into every new Soul relationship ties, baby mm -hmm. Soul ties. Mm -hmm. yeah but i know i know of one um couple where the the husband had more of a sexual past than the wife did um and it was a struggle for the wife because because of those beliefs, because of those myths, like, is he going to be comparing me to his past, you know, partners? Is, are those people going to affect our sex life? Is he going to, you know, think of her when he's with me, you know, so it's, it's still, it's still affected, um, affected them, even though they chose to wait because they had different levels of sexual past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But is that her holding him accountable to this? But I wonder, did he feel any of those pressures? Did he feel damaged? Did he carry any of that shame himself? Right. No, <laughs> no, no. Didn't have the guilt and shame because, um, again, it wasn't as emphasized for, for males as it is for females to be pure and to be virtuous. So, yeah. oh, well. and I specifically remember being taught that the whole receiver, because, you know, the man is the one ejaculating. So the woman is the one receiving it. So all of that is what you carrying in your body. And, you know, that's so to grow and you want it and you're going to lay down with this person and laying down with him. You actually laying down with, you know, Tom, Harry, and Dick, yes, Dick. thank you. Dick, Tom, <laughs> Harry, Chad, the names. This will not get the three names. things in, in order. The names. Harry, Dick, Tom, you know who the names are. <laughs> Child, ben, Peter, and Rob is what I want to say. The, now you laying down with this man. Now he laying down with Ben, Peter, and Rob, and Michael. Child, why got to be all that? Why? They would really say that. Why? You have sex Literally. with one person, he has sex with five. You just had sex with six people. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. I, ain't that man. I only did one. Mm -hmm. I got to go and do all this other stuff. What have you guys heard about soul ties? You mentioned that, and that's something that I get pushed back on from Christians when I talk about the damaged goods myth is they're like, well, what about soul ties? And I'm like, as a psychologist, I have never heard this term. Like, this is not a, this is not a real thing. Like, so what have you guys heard? Girl, welcome to black church. Man. Go and describe it, kid. Soul ties. Let me tell you what it is, Dr. Camden. Me and Melissa, if we're not married and we have sex, a piece of her soul is forever entwined with mine and a piece of my soul is forever entwined with hers because we had premarital sex. And for every person she has sex with and I have sex with, heavier leaned towards the women, uh, she has a piece of all these. So it's basically exponentially damaged goods. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever spirits and stuff they had attached to them, in addition, she also has opened herself up to those spirits and I've opened myself up to her spirits. And I mean, I remember when I was a kid, they said, you have sex with a person that got an attitude. Now you got an attitude all the time. Say that. And you didn't even used to be like that. And I was like, I was Geez. just going to say something like that because they used to even like depression or if you, uh -huh. they, if you felt like you started acting funny, it's because one of them 
one of them ties mm -hmm. is now coming up in you. Okay. But doesn't our soul belong to God? Hey! You know, it's the question for me. <laughs> yeah. If our soul belongs to God, you know, and that he, he gave it to us and we've invited him into our lives, then we're not giving away those pieces. We've given it to God. It belongs to him. Our friend Candace said this too. And she said, even if they were true, isn't God the breaker of chains? Mm -hmm. Would he not wash us white as snow? Would he not cleanse us of all? Why would he not be able to cleanse us of that sin if sure. he can cleanse us of all so other good. sins? Why so would he good. not wash us? Why would his blood not wash that clean if he could wash everything? So what she said is, you are we limiting Jesus's power mm. by saying this is something he cannot do? That's so good. And I said, well, listen, I ain't no theologian, but it makes everything else about Jesus maybe think he could do, God could do anything. I could do anything. <laughs> so <laughs> again, that was another thing that when it's pitched to you as a kid, you're like, that makes sense. But when it's challenged to you, it's also like, that makes sense. Right. And I know God, if he got about that grave, Come on. why could he not? If he already died on the cross for our sin, all sin, why couldn't he die on the cross for that? And also, is it premarital sex if you just got divorced? Shut up! <laughs> if you have, if Melissa and I got divorced and then we have sex after that, is that premarital sex? We already been married. It's postmarital sex. <laughs> we were married. The body remembers. Joshua said. Then she's my post soul tie. I'm confused, Shut Dr. Camden. <laughs> But you're not planning on anything like that, right? No, no, no. no. I was just being no. silly because my cousin yeah. always says, is it premarital sex if I don't ever get married? What? What? Always looking for a loophole. That's that cigarette smoke. <gasps> you done smelled it. Now you're on that rock. <laughs> but no, I think it's so interesting that it, even as a psychologist and a Christian, and if you, you were not, you you never even heard of that. I and do, we heard it so much. But I do think that that is cultural. I do because too. I do think that soul, soul ties are very heavy black church. Yeah. Very heavy black church. So it's shacking up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I have heard of them. I just, I just wasn't clear on what it is because it's like, this is not an actual like biological or psychological term. And there's no like actual evidence that this happens. So, um, but yeah, I like what you said about it's limiting God's power. Um, when he forgives our sins in there, as far as the east is from the west, there's Damn no time. Old and then yeah. those them well, throws them well. <laughs> into the sea of forgetfulness. Y'all didn't know. I that. felt like there was a Jeffrey question. Uh, <laughs> I knew I should have known that answer, but I was like, <laughs> where did he throw yeah. it? Y'all didn't get it. Oh, that's fine. Where he throw it? In where the he trash? Throw it? Yeah, shot in the trash <laughs> so you can pick it back up. <laughs> Are y'all ready for the last myth? Yeah. Last one, Dr. Camden. All right, the last one is the gatekeepers myth that women are the gatekeepers of sexuality, of men's sexuality. So before marriage, that means they're responsible for putting on the brakes, setting the sexual boundaries, making sure things don't go too far. But then after marriage, they're also still responsible for giving sex to their man so that he doesn't leave, he doesn't look elsewhere, he doesn't look to porn, um, fulfilling his needs, making sure they're having sex enough with him to keep him happy. But it's not a mutual thing. It's very one-sided. And you were, you were getting to that earlier too. So this affects women before and after marriage. You know what? I never heard this one. I haven't either. That, but you know what? Let me tell you what. I play into this. I can already see. My wife won't give me none. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We heard that so much growing right. up. Do this and then your wife will give you some. I've said this before on the podcast. Remember, the clearest day in a mar married, what was it called? Marriage Rich Man. The oh, speaker yeah. said, you want to get the draws, you got to buy her a gift. You buy her a gift, you take the draws off literally and then jasmine sullivan got a song called hotels which basically talks about uh women be hoeing for their husbands doing stuff in exchange but i never heard of it as the women is the, always a sole decider whether you can or can't before marriage and after marriage and as men we definitely are trained we got to do enough so she says yes mm -hmm. she gives it to you yeah but that's on the marriage side but what dr camden is also saying is that we're also responsible for you not falling Mm -hmm. like, right. there's pressure on both sides how and much sex is enough to keep you happy but not enough so i'm happy well i don't think seem like your happiness is included in this equation no this whole thing is very patriarchal yeah. mm -hmm. it is yeah and it's very one-sided what you're describing sounds like sex is something to give and to take rather than something to share you know i think 
God made sex to be something to share in a marriage and something where we're mutually um, enjoying it and mutually sharing like with that. each other, sharing our bodies, sharing our, you know, intimacy, but it's not something that, you know, I'm taking from her. She's giving to me, you know, things like that. That, that kind of language just sounds more manipulative and controlling. Yeah. And I don't think that has any place in, you know, a godly marriage. Something to share. Let me share in the coochie. It is yours if I can partake. And you can you can have some peanuts. You can have some peanuts. How much? It's just like when you get to dinner. We order one steak. You have a little piece. Yes. You have a little piece of meat that I take. And I have some of your macaroni. It also breeds <laughs> this idea of obligation. A piece of pain. Yes. It also breeds this idea that, well, he spent this much. So now he's expecting it. And now I feel like I need to fulfill it mm -hmm. all of that circles around this that the gatekeeper thing yeah and it's so it's unfair and it puts a lot of women in well men but it puts women in those compromising yeah. positions because you feel the need to succumb to absolutely mm -hmm. that, is, man, that is that is go, go ahead doctor well i was gonna say duty or obligation sex that's also a huge libido killer like that's not pleasurable when you feel like it's a duty um, and sex is going to be more pleasurable and enjoyable for both partners when both partners are into the idea, you know, when they have both consented and they're both into it, they're both excited about it. And it's the pleasure of both is the focus and not just one, then they're both going to be into it. It's a win-win in that situation. You yeah. know, what's really interesting. I love this conversation. And the thing I am thankful for conversations like this, I feel, I feel like our children, specifically our sons, they have a better shot at a holistic approach to oh, sex sure. and marriage. Mm -hmm. We had to really look in the mirror and say, are we going to repeat what we were taught to our kids just because we were taught it? Are we going to do research? And, you know, thankfully we do this podcast. I'm actually eternally grateful for it because we get to hear our leaders in these conversations. And I feel like our sons have a more healthy look. I, my parents thought if they talked about sex with us, we would go and have it. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So they just didn't say anything, but it wasn't like that made, we didn't get any knowledge about it. It just didn't come from the right mm -hmm. sources. Now mm -hmm. we have already have conversations with ourselves about sex and we can, it's kind of a lot more of a con uh, continuing conversation, but I feel like they have so much more of a holistic approach to it. They have a better chance of having a great fulfilling sex life. It's kind of like in Italy, uh, they drink wine with dinner and it's a part of culture. And they talk about alcohol more openly and apparently they have a lot lower rates of alcoholism because it's not a you can't do this this is the, you know what and i'm saying driving and drunk driving and you just don't like melissa and i drink in front of our kids we tell them about alcohol melissa was saying she's always said to our boys when you first turn first turn 21 i'll be the first one to buy you your first drink um and it's not like these things are inherently bad mm -hmm. it's here's a holistic approach to this thing nothing's mm -hmm. inherently bad or good a car is not bad right. but if i get into it drunk and drive it into a a wall, I can hurt myself. If I drive it on freeway, I can hurt others. If I practice, if I'm clear and sober, it can take me to work or to Miami or whatever. And I think that's a better approach to all these conversations than this is bad, this is wrong, better not do, better not do, better not do. Then you do it like now you're wrong, now you're sad, now you're going to hell, which mm -hmm. is kind of how we were taught, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and talking about it with your kids isn't going to put the idea in their head. It's already there, like you said. Mm -hmm. That's something that I was taught as a therapist. Like, you know, I have to ask about suicidal thoughts with every client that I meet with and check in with, with them on that. And I was taught, you're not putting that idea in their head. It's like we already been there. And so by asking about it, you're actually destigmatizing it. You're demystifying it. You're, you're giving them space to talk about the thoughts that are scary and that maybe they haven't been able to admit to anyone else. Um, so I know that's a different issue than what we're talking about with sex, but the same kind of concept of you're just giving space and allowing your children to talk about it with you in a non-shaming way when you bring it up. Yeah, that's good. Absolutely. Um, to close out, Dr. Camden, I want to circle back to the reconciliation of these myths and as Christians and those of us who maybe feel um, jaded <laughs> when it comes to reconciling this, you're in your marriage now, you struggle and now you may it, how, what are some tools or things that you recommend to help those of us in that type of situation? Mm -hmm. Well, I already mentioned the book, the, um, the, the Great Sex Rescue um, by Sheila Grigoire. Um, and of course I would I would recommend the articles that I've got on my blog and, and the things that I write about, but um, just 
also seeing a therapist. If, if this is something that's really affected you and continue to affect you, it's important to have somebody that can walk alongside you with it. And you might try to find a Christian therapist, but really a licensed therapist um, is the key. And you could find a, someone who's trained in, in sex therapy too, or trained in religious issues and who's going to be familiar with purity culture since um, not every therapist might be. Um, but yeah, like we talked about reading a bunch of different perspectives and praying about it and reading what the truths are actually in the Bible and not just what you were taught at church or taught um, from your family. Um, I think all of those things combined can help people develop their theology of sexuality, their beliefs about sexuality and how they want to live that out in a way that's honoring to God without the shame and fear of purity culture. Yeah. I think that is um, one of the biggest uh, issues, of course, is that shame and and pu- or shame and guilt surrounding uh, purity mm-hmm. culture. What do you? Uh, this is a very Melissa centered question. I'm going to ask uh, uh, for you know those ha- who have done. I have done you know the books. I've read. I've done. I've had the experts. Yada yada yada. What are some ways to overcome that shame and that guilt? And like, I, I don't know if I'm asking for something that you can do every day, like maybe it's a mantra, girl, I don't know, that you can, something to overcome that and combat that on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I think it's a process. I mean, I think it's a long process of daily renewing your mind, Um, you know, and it's, it's a similar kind when there's these ingrained beliefs um, and, you know, whether it's about sexuality or whether it's about your self-worth or value, um, your self-esteem, things like that. It's really a daily process of recognizing the lies that you hear in your head and replacing that with truth and allowing your behavior to align with that truth. So if your new truth is that sexuality is good and from God and it's a gift to enjoy in marriage, then align your behavior with that, you know, of really enjoying it in marriage instead of it being like, oh, I've got to, I've got to give it to him today because we haven't done it in a few days or something like that, you know, so aligning your your new beliefs with your actions that will help with the congruence and help and help you get help you with the transforming your mind that's so good yeah Yeah. that was very very good okay uh dr camden thank you so much for joining us on today before we um let you go can you please give your social media your blog and all of that for those of our listeners who want to find you and follow you online Okay. Yeah. My website is drcamden.com and I have a quiz on my website called which purity culture myth affects you. So it's a, it's a quick quiz um, based on my five myths and you can see which ones you score highest on, which of the myths you might still believing. So, um, so that's a good resource on my website. And then I'm on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter under Dr. Camden as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, I thought someone was asking a question. Thank you so much. I think that this was fabulous and um, really a culmination of everything I feel like this platform yeah. is in a podcast. I really, truly I do. do as well. I think we are, I'm, I'm really so glad to have talked to you mm-hmm. because I think we are, we are trying to do the right thing right. Mm-hmm. in life, in sex. We are trying to follow the Bible, the world, I mean, the, the word uh, but sometimes we just need a little course correction, a little guidance. And I think um, empowering us at our age hopefully empowers the generation uh, coming behind us. And hopefully, you know, two, three generations, if we don't destroy the planet Earth, our kids will be sexually whole and free to enjoy marriage and not shamed into like, you know, um, bad marriages or you had sex and you're shamed of that. And just shame, shame, shame. Yeah. on Siri. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's Siri. Shame, shame, yeah. shame. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. The biggest questions I get now are about parenting and how are we going to raise our children with, uh, with our, you know, Christian beliefs and our values about sex, but without the shame. And I think that's the biggest challenge right now for me too. I have a toddler, so <laughs> I've still got um, a ways off before we have more conversations about sex, but still laying the foundation, making right. it ongoing. And it's like, how do I want her to see um, the beauty of God's purpose for sex and marriage, but not have um, shame and fear around it? So that's yeah. So good. I, I now fully want to do a podcast episode on that. How to because talk to your kids. How about. to talk to your kids yeah. after reconciling the purity culture thing. Let me tell because you, you don't want to steer, you know, too far one way or the other. 
Um, and for us, oh, I know we struggle because he's big struggle because it's like, okay, we want to have these conversations <laughs> to ensure we're having like a sex positive family, but then also to the point of, well, I'll tell you too much time. You going in and be experimenting, looking at stuff. And then you got a bunch of hangups that I gave you on accident. Chad, mm-hmm. I know that ain't how it worked, but it, I'd be lying if I told you that ain't sometimes what run through my mind. Yeah. So being able to reconcile those things as parents where you're like, listen, look, I already know everybody need therapy, good parents, bad parents, we trying our hardest, but can I just not have you in like the worst therapy? Cause I just really screwed you up as a mama. <laughs> I, yes. I also tell our kids, we don't know everything. We are just trying to get by, trying to survive. Yeah. They ain't give us no doggone pamphlet. Not even a pamphlet of what to tell these doggone kids. Yes. No program, no book. I got more training to put burgers in the back of a broiler at Burger King <laughs> than to raise a whole entire human being. They didn't even That's let me crazy. touch nothing for the first week. So they just bad. doggone handed me the baby at the hospital down to the St. Joseph's. So nice. I know. I feel you. I was I was already a psychologist when I had her and have all these, this training in child development, all this stuff. And I was still like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Her baby came out and was like, baby shark, what? That wasn't in none of my books. Yeah, listen. <laughs> Coco Melon. What y'all yep. That's big at our house. Yeah. <laughs> All the kids Thank you love so it. much, Dr. Candy. What a what a what Thank a treat you were. This was oh, real. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for inviting me. I'll follow her, read up on her stuff. Uh, and, and learn yourself some and then talk with yourself about it and then tell us what you think. All yeah. right. Thank you guys so much. Until the next episode. Bye. Bye. I, 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 I. <laughs>